My name is Dougal. Uh, Wonder is a week of events by the Warwick Christian Union. It's called Wonder because we all have big questions that we think are important to discover um, and really to dive into and find answers for. So today in this uh, first lunch bar and our first event, we'll be having a talk which will be followed by a QA. and um, If you want to text in your questions for the Q&A, um, the number is around uh, the room and just text them in um, as the talk is going on. And he's going to be talking on the topic of how science made God redundant. So, yeah, during the talk, um, if you take your questions in, the number is around, um, and if you can't see it, then it's 0703 11560. 5460. Yeah, that's right. 5460. Yeah, great. Enjoy the talk. Great. Hello, everyone. Um, so, it's really nice to be here. As they said, I've come all the way from Southampton today. Hello, you can hear me now. Um, I'm a research fellow down there, which means I basically just spend uh, most of my day in the lab. I've got a small group of students and we're working in this field of regenerative medicine. Um, our research is trying to use stem cells to regenerate little, little bits of tissue. My actual very specific um, work that I'm doing is exploring the use of little blobs of jelly formed from clay nanoparticles as a way of delivering stem cells into their body and controlling what, you, what they do in there. So, I know it sounds like a weird idea, doesn't it? I've actually been given a million pounds by the government to do this, so I really hope it's going to work. <laughs> we're, um, we're here this week, as they said, um, really to give you guys the opportunity to explore um, the message of Christianity and the person of Jesus Christ for yourself. Um, what, what that, what we, the reason for doing that, really, is Christians call this message gospel. Gospel literally means good news. Um, and it's good because it shows us that ultimate reality is um, not some great big um, cosmic accident that threw us into being, um, nor are we here on the whim of some omnipotent deity who made us with a flex of his muscles uh, just because he can. But the reason you and I exist, the reason we're here, is out of the overflowing generosity of a God of love. This is the message that Jesus Christ brings us and shows us. And if it's true, it changes everything. It means that life's not just about surviving long enough to pass in your genes. It's not just about passing some great big moral exam to somehow validate your existence. No, life is about living in this world, enjoying um, this world, caring for this world, and knowing the, the love of the God who made us. It's a very life-affirming and dignifying message. And yet, we're also very aware that there are all kinds of very, very fundamental objections to this method message. Um, and these objections have a very, um, have a lot of weight in our minds. Um, and they can often even stop us from really considering the possibility that this could be true. So what we're wanting to do, especially in these lunchtime talks, is to try and um, address some of these objections head on, really with the hope of kind of reopening investigations once again. So that, that's, that's our motives um, for doing this. And the big objection, the big question we're thinking about today is the formidable question of science and whether science has somehow invalidated belief in God or perhaps made um, belief in God as an explanation for things um, unnecessary. So that's, that's the question uh, that we're going to be thinking about. And it's a very, um, very prominent idea. Let's see if I can flick these on. Here we are. So this is uh, Peter Atkins. Uh, Peter Atkins is a professor of chemistry in Oxford. He's a uh, well-known popularizer of science. And here he is in an essay, quite a famous essay called The Limitless Power of Science, talking about the relationship between science and religion. He says, science the system of belief founded securely on publicly shared, reproducible knowledge emerged from religion. As science discarded its chrysalis to become its present butterfly, it took over the heath. So for Atkins, religion had a, a sort of placed role to play in our intellectual history, but that role has now been thoroughly um, superseded uh, because of the limitless power of science. And like a butterfly emerging from a restrictive chrysalis, science has allowed us 
to spread our wings um, like the beautiful enlightened butterflies we are and take over the heath. He goes on to say, um, let's see if I can get it on, there we are. There is no reason to suppose that science cannot deal with every aspect of existence. Only the religious, among whom I include not only the prejudiced but the uninformed, hope there is a dark corner of the physical universe or of the universe of experience that science can never hope to illuminate. So science gives us this uniquely powerful way of understanding the world. It is publicly accessible, reproducible knowledge. Um, so Atkins is claiming, first of all, that science is exclusive in its reliability, in the power it has to explore and understand the world. Um, and also, it's sufficient. He goes on to say that there is no space that science cannot hope to illuminate. It gives us this kind of fully orbed, uh, comprehensive understanding of the world, which excludes any need for religious belief or the idea of God. So that's the idea. Those two real big ideas that I'd like us to explore. The sufficiency of science to explain everything and the exclusivity of science in its ability to give us reliable knowledge of the world. There's one more quote. Um, this is uh, James Watson, co-discoverer of Francis Crick, of the double helical structure of DNA. Um, and he talks about um, religious scientists like me. He says, occasionally I meet them and I'm a bit embarrassed because I cannot believe anyone who accepts truth by revelation. So obviously that hurts me a little bit. So part of the reason I'm here today as well is to kind of justify my own existence as a scientist who is also a Christian. I take courage in that uh, by the fact there are other many great Christians throughout the history of science and up to the present day um, who have no uh, problem holding their Christianity and their scientific beliefs together. So James Watson, he initiated this great big um, human genome project um, that in 2003 saw the complete mapping of the human genome. Um, his successor and the one to ultimately see its completion is this chap here, Francis Collins. He's now um, director of the NIH, appointed by uh, Obama. And he writes in his biography in 2005 explaining this great human genome project and his, his intellectual biography, also his biography about becoming Christian. He says at the end of that, I had started this journey of intellectual exploration to confirm my atheism that now lay in ruins as I was forced to admit the plausibility of the God hypothesis. So if nothing else, that should give us pause for thought. It's not quite as simple, perhaps, as people like um, James Watson and, and um, <coughs> Peter Atkins would have us believe. It's quite possible to um, be a Christian and also an intellectually fulfilled um, scientist. So that's what I'd like us to explore. Let me tell you a bit more about my um, research. So one of the big, big breakthroughs in the field of stem cells and regenerative medicine was made by this chap here. This is um, uh, um, Shinya Yamanaka. Uh, he won a Nobel Prize for discovering this technology of induced pluripotent stem cells. What are they? So a stem cell is a type of cell, a very special type of cell, that can specialize into all of the different cells that make up our body. So when you're a little embryo, a few cells big, you're basically totipotent stem cells. Those cells couldn't do anything, but they could specialize to become all of the different cells, your brain, your blood, your bone cells that make up your body. Now, over the course of development, that potential is very quickly restricted, um, which means they have a limited ability to repair the different tissues that we might want to repair when our body goes wrong. But Shinya Yamanaka, he made this amazing discovery. He found that you could take a fully specialized skin cell, or really any cell, um, even old bladder cells washed out in your wee, you could take those cells, um, grow them up in the lab, turn on a few key genes, and transform those cells, reprogram those cells back into being stem cells again. It's an amazing thing. So one day you could wee into a pot, scientists could take some of those cells, turn on some genes, make them into stem cells, and then specialize them into um, new neurons or something to treat Parkinson's. Ma amazing thing. And the way he um, kind of demonstrated this was he took some of his specialized, his, his reprogrammed cells and injected them um, into a mouse embryo. Now, if they were normal cells, normal skin cells, they'd just die and not do anything. But if they were stem cells, those cells could fuse with the embryo and go on to contribute to all of the different tissues that make up this map, this new mouse, and that's what he got. He got a chimeric mouse, a mouse with two different genetic identities. His stem cells that he had growing in his dish um, had been injected into the embryo, and then they went on to form all the different tissues in that mouse's body. So it's a very, very powerful demonstration of an astonishing discovery. 
And it's just this that gives science such massive credibility in our culture. This is what Richard Dawkins is talking about here. He says, science boosts its claim to truth by its spectacular ability to make matter and energy jump through hoops on command and to predict what will happen and when. Science has huge credibility because of its power to transform our world and predict what will happen and when. And this has caused many people to say, OK, so science is so good at giving us reliable, publicly accessible knowledge about our world that actually it's really the only reliable tool we have for understanding our world. That's the claim. And what that claim leads to is a very sustained and now very well-developed project to try and account for every part of our human existence only in terms of what we can find out by science. So this is um, Daniel Dennett being very explicit about this. He wrote a book uh, modestly called Consciousness Explained, and in it he tried to sustain this project. There is only one sort of stuff, namely matter, the physical stuff of physics, chemistry, and physiology. We can, in principle, we're not, not there yet, but scientists are working on it, account for every mental phenomena using the same physical principles, laws, and raw materials. So that's the project, to try and account for everything only into what can be found out through biology, chemistry, and physics. Now this can lead to some very counterintuitive um, ideas about ourselves. So this is Francis Crick, very famous quote. Uh, sorry, I'm... Here you, are. you, your joys and your sorrows, your memories, your ambitions, your sense of personal identity and free will are in fact no more, that's the key phrase, no more than the behaviour of a vast assembly of nerve cells and their associated molecules. The things that are at the core of who you are, the things that are most important to your personal identity are nothing more than molecules being fired by nerve cells. This is... Um, Richard Dawkins, in an interview, talking about love. It's a Christian interviewer. He's asked um, what love means. When you think about your wife, what does love mean? Dawkins says, well, we've been into this before. It's an emotion which is a manifestation of brain stuff. Jesus said, love is the purpose of life. Does that sound nonsense to you? He says, it sounds like something grafted on, a superfluous excrescence on life, which I feel I understand better. But it doesn't surprise me that brains, being what they are, have a capacity to invent spurious purposes of the universe. So for Richard Dawkins, love is nothing more than a manifestation of brain stuff. And although love might seem really important to us, although love might um, be right at the core of why we do what we do, the thing that's most important about who we are and what life's about, what our lives are about, Actually, Dawkins says that's something we're imposing on reality. It's something we're reading in to reality that's not really there. Now, intuitively, that seems inadequate, doesn't it? It seems if we're restricted to this type of explanation of that biology allows, if we try and squeeze ourselves into a biological explanation, it seems inadequate. It doesn't seem sufficient to account for our lived human experience to explain the very mo the most important things that we have about being human beings. But there's also a harder philosophical issue with what, what Dawkins is saying. And the clue to that is what he says last of all. Brains, being what they are, have a capacity to invent spurious purposes of the universe. What are brains? What are brains for? Well, this is Patricia Churchland. She's jumping ahead again. Here we are. This is Patricia Churchland. She's a, a philosopher of science in California. She talks about the function of our brains. Boiled down to essentials, the principal chore of nervous systems is to get the body parts where they should be in order that the organism may survive. A fancier <coughs> style of representing is advantageous so long as it is geared to the organism's way of life and enhances the organism's chance of survival. Truth, whatever that is, definitely takes the hindmost. Do you see what she's saying? She's saying the reason you and I have brains, the reasons we think, the reasons we try and um, represent and make sense of our world, is ultimately not to discover what's true. Ultimately, the purpose of our brains, the function of our brains, is to help us survive, and that is all. Now, sometimes survival and truth-finding will align. Sometimes we need to know that it's not good to stroke lions and that kind of thing. 
um, sometimes survival and truth finding alliance, but often it won't. And a case in point here is religion. Religion is often given as a very prominent way in which uh, we delude ourselves for survival benefit. But the problem with that, the problem with saying that the purpose of our brains, the ultimate function of our brains, is not to give us true things, but to help us survive, is that finally it means we cannot trust our brains. Even when my brain tells me, I can't trust my brain, I can't trust my brain. <coughs> Philosophers call it a self-refuting <coughs> belief. This is Raymond Tallis um, talking about the same idea. The biologistic image of humans, this bio the attempt to explain everything about us in terms of biology, effectively denies the centrality, even the possibility of precisely those unique capacities that have made humans able to theorize about evolution or to develop neuroscience. If, and this is the key point, if on the origin of the species really were the last word on humanity, it could not have been written. So you see, the attempt to try and understand ourselves comprehensively, the attempt to explain ourselves fully only in terms of biology and chemistry and physics, ultimately fails. By censoring out anything that can't be validated by a science experiment, ultimately means our human story no longer makes sense. It becomes incoherent. So in order to understand ourselves, we need to go beyond what biology, chemistry and physics can tell us. But what, what, what else is there? How else can we find out about ourselves? This is Max Planck. Experiments are the only means of knowledge at our disposal. The rest is poetry and imagination. And this is Bertrand Russell. Whatever knowledge is attainable must be attained by scientific methods. And what science cannot discover, mankind cannot know. Now, now there's an obvious problem with this, isn't there? What Bertrand Russell is here saying, it's a claim to knowledge, and yet it's a claim that cannot be discovered by a scientific experiment. But there's also another mistake going on here. And this is a mistake that's a very well-known mistake in the philosophy of science. This is an attempt to explain it. Rather boring um, philosophy of science textbook. But it makes this important point. If he be a man engaged in any important inquiry, you'll be pleased to know that women don't make this mistake, he must have a method and he will be under a strong and constant temptation to make a metaphysics out of his method. Almost make a religion out of his method. That's what he's saying. That is to suppose the universe ultimately of such a sort that his method must be appropriate and successful. This attempt to try and say we're only going to use the scientific method to understand ourselves is a mistake. It's actually a very basic mistake that my two-year-old daughter <laughs> was able to learn very early on. So this is my daughter when she was just about nine, ten months old. At that age, I would be um, playing with my phone in front of her like a, a good father, and she'll want to play with my phone. At that age, it was fine for me just to put my phone in my pocket, and she'd forget about the phone and go on to wanting something else she couldn't have. But a, a few months later, that no longer worked. She'd learned this mistake. She learned that just because she couldn't see the phone didn't mean it wasn't available for her to play with. She just needed to use a different method to get access to it. She needed to put on a cute face like that or tug my sleeve or something. She needed a new method to get access to my phone. It's an idea that scientists know very early on. It's no good saying, I've got this really great assay. It always gives me really reliable results. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to squeeze my entire subject only into what I can find out using this experiment. An astronomer doesn't say, well, you know, my telescope can only see so far. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to limit my understanding of the universe only into what I can see through my telescope. Now, scientists goes at finding new ways to see further. Scientists ask this very important question. What if? What if there's more out there to discover? How will I discover it? So this attempt to say, I'll only use the scientific method, is ultimately not very scientific. So let's think about purpose, briefly, before we finish. How would we discover a purpose to the universe if there was one? What method would we have to use? This is a very helpful quote by a philosopher, theologian called Leslie Newbigin. He says this, Cause can be discovered by science, but purpose cannot, because until the purpose has been realised, it is hidden in the mind of the one whose purpose it is. 
Newbegin recognises that purpose is something persons have. Persons who can look forward into the future and form desires and make goals and set about finding out ways to achieve those goals. Purpose is something persons have. And as such, it's hidden. It's hidden in the mind of the one whose purpose it is. He gives this image of a building site. Imagine you go out and you come across some bricks stacked up here and there and um, some tools lying around. And you decide that there might be a purpose to what's going on. It's a good analogy, isn't it? Because that's very much like our experience. There's a whole load of ambiguity and mess in life, and yet all around as well, there are clues, there are senses that there might be a purpose to what's going on. How would we go about discovering what that purpose is? He says you've got two options. You can take the empirical approach. You can go back every single day and see what happens, what emerges from the rubble, and what form this building takes. Or you can go to the architect or the builder and ask them to reveal to you what their purpose is. And Newbigin says, when it comes to finding out the purpose of the universe, waiting around until the end is not an option for us. If we're to discover what the purpose of life is, the one whose purpose it is needs to make it known to us. At the heart of Christianity is a claim that God, the one whose purpose it is, has made himself and his purposes known to us. The very famous passage at the beginning of one of the early accounts of Jesus' life in the Gospel of John, it says this, In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. That word, word, is the Greek term logos. In those days, the philosophers um, had this idea that behind everything, ultimate reality, there was an inherent harmony, a purpose, a reason behind what was going on. And if you were to live a good life, a life that actually meant something, the key thing was to find out what that purpose was and to live in harmony with it. That's how you lived a good, free, purposeful, meaningful life. That was the goal of the philosophers. And John makes this claim. First of all, he says, the word was with God, the word was God, he was in the beginning with God. He's saying the ultimate reality, the one whose purpose it is, the reason behind everything is not something, it's not some abstract principle, it's someone. But he goes even further. He says in the next few verses down, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. No one has ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side he has made him known. The word, the one whose purpose it is, has made himself accessible to us. Ultimately, I think the reason science is so successful, so powerful, is not just because of the supremacy of its methods, not just because of the ingenuity, the robustness of peer review and everything like that. Ultimately, the reason science is so successful is because of the accessibility of its subject matter. Science deals with the stuff you can get your hands on, you can prod and poke and manipulate and control. When science advances, it's because new technologies have come about that allow new swathes of reality to become accessible to us. Science is successful because of the accessibility of its subject matter. Christianity says that in Jesus Christ, God himself has made himself accessible to us. The word became flesh. God has submitted himself to our scrutiny. You can't scrutinise an abstract philosophy. You can't scrutinise a private revelation in the cave. But the claim of Christianity is that in Jesus Christ, God himself came and lived in this world. He impacted this world. He made an effect on history. And that is something we can scrutinise, we can investigate. And finally, because this is a person, it means that God himself has made himself accessible to people like you and me. You don't have to be a great scientist to encounter ultimate reality. You don't have to be one of those great Greek philosophers. God himself has made himself accessible to you and me. He's made himself knowable to people like you and me. That might make you feel a bit uncomfortable. I'm a scientist, I know we're not people people. <laughs> but to say, I'll only believe in something I can do an scientific experiment on, is ultimately to decide the answer even before you've begun your investigation. 
If ultimate reality is not something but someone, the way you need to encounter the reality is different. I'm a scientist, I'm also married. I know doing experiments on someone is not a good way of getting to know them. The claim of Christianity is that you can know ultimate reality. He has made himself known to us. There's loads of questions that raises, um, and we've got some time for questions now, but I'm going to wrap up and hand back over to our chairs. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs> Hello, Sarah. <laughs> Thank you. If you have any questions, please text them in um, to the number which should be on the screens. So please start texting your questions now if you haven't already. Thank you. Yeah, that would be great if you send in any of your questions um, that have been raised by that. We've got, um, we'll kick off right now at the moment. Um, we've got one question which is a broad one. It covers a lot of topics. Okay. Um, and it is, what are your views on creation? Okay. So my main view on creation is that it's creation. <laughs> um, the fundamental thing about our existence is that there is a reason for it. We came into being um, because of God's desire to bring a world into being. So creation, the, everything, the reason we're here, the reason there is something rather than nothing is because God in his creative, generous love um, sought to bring us into being. But I think that is open um it is very open as to how he did that um there's an account in there's several accounts in the bible as to god's creation um but those accounts um leave open a whole range of different ways that that could have come about and one of the ways we can find out about how god created the world is through the methods of the natural sciences and trying to uh, probe um, right back as far as we can the earliest events that brought um, the universe life as we know it into being. Um, and that's, I think, part of the reason why one of the things that the Bible shows us is that we were made to know and understand and explore this world. So the Bible gives us um, a reason for science in that the reason we're here is ultimately as a result of a rational creator God. Um, the reason the universe is here is because of a rational creator God. And that means we can expect that we as people made in God's image can understand and seek to understand um, the world God has made. So the Christian view of creation gives you a very firm basis for undertaking science. It gives you a reason to expect us to be able to make sense of why we're here and how this world was made. Um, there's probably in that question as well um, the idea that of the idea of evolution and creation being in conflict. Um, and I know there's a range of uh, views in Christianity about that. My my basic response to that is to say that Darwin helped us see a mechanism for what was already there in Genesis right at the beginning where it says the earth brought forth plants, the earth brought forth animals. Um, Genesis says that the earth had a kind of functional capacity to bring forth um, life um, and I think Darwin provided a very good model for a potential mechanism for how that could have come about. So, yeah, thank you. That's great, thank you. Yeah, we've got another question now. Um, so, if you say that Christianity is dependent on the person of Jesus, hmm. is there any evidence that he rose from the dead? Did his disciples just lie about seeing him post-resurrection? <laughs> Great question, thank you. So this is the key question, really. Um, if I said that God submits himself to our scrutiny. Actually, in the person of Jesus, where Paul really kind of nails down on one point. He says, if Jesus Christ did not raise from the dead, then we are of all men most to be pitied. He's saying everything's a sham. If Jesus Christ did not rise from the dead, then the whole of Christianity is a sham. So this is a very key question, and it all depends on this. Now, I know there'll be plenty of opportunity to explore this question through um, the rest of the week. I think one of the things that I find most compelling about this is the fact that none of the disciples, none of Jesus' followers, seem to anticipate Jesus' resurrection from the dead at all. And there's a good reason for this. When Jesus Christ was hung up on the cross and crucified, if there was 
ever a proof, a kind of falsification of Christianity, that was it. Because what kind of God would submit himself to such a thing? What kind of God dies? It's crazy. Um, If you're a Roman, the cross was the kind of ultimate demonstration of weakness and failure. If you're a Jew, it was even more kind of, um, uh, it was even more significant because of verses which said things like, whoever is hung up on a tree is cursed by God. It was almost as if God had cursed him and rejected him. That was the proof. And so the disciples um, locked themselves in a room and tried to hide it out. The women who went to the tomb, they went there to embalm the body because they were expecting it to be rotting away in the tomb. No one, no one anticipated it. And when the women found the empty tomb, no one believed them because there were too many other possible explanations. And when some of the disciples encountered him on the road, no one believed them because no one was expecting that Jesus Christ had risen from the dead. And yet, somehow they all came to believe. These disciples, um, from their testimonies we know, had such real, tangible, obvious experiences of the risen Lord Jesus that not one of them would ever deny again what they'd seen. They say, you can kill us, you can tell us to shut up, but it doesn't change anything. We saw him, we touched him, we encountered him, really. And the way we know it is we we read their accounts, and that's what you've got to do. We've got to read their accounts and try and make sense of them. And various people have tried to explain away and come up with alternate explanations, and that's really the job you've got to do. But let me warn you, it's very, very hard to come up with a decent alternative explanation for the events of that first Easter day. But that's over to you. You've got to look into the evidence and decide for yourself. Thank you. Um, we don't actually have much time now um, <coughs> for many more questions. Um, you mentioned there um, you've got to read the accounts. Um, I'd just like to briefly uh, plug you. See, you might be able to see some uncovers on the table. They are an account of Jesus' life. Um, it's the Gospel of John. Um, So if you do want to read some of those accounts, I would encourage you to take some. And there's more on the back in the Discover More section if you'd like to read them there. Um, We thank you for coming, really. We hope you enjoyed your lunch and the talk. Um, And please stay for the lunch bar if you've got uh, time. Now there's another one um, afterwards, um, which is on the topic of how can faith be reasonable. Uh, We've also got um, um, an evening event um, tonight and kind of at 7 o'clock. There's flyers on your tables. Uh, that'll be a comedy night. Um, it'll be a relaxed environment. It'll be great to see you there. There'll also, um, there's also an international meal um, this evening. These flyers are also on your table, um, along with the lunch bar that I just mentioned earlier. Also on your way out, if you'd like to see more about what we're doing this week at Wonder, there will be weekly timetables in these little <coughs> booklets here. There might be some on your table. Have a look there. It'll be great to see you coming along to some of these events. Um, We'll be asking similar questions, real big, deep questions about the Christian faith. Yeah, thank you. As well, um, on your tables, you should all have a feedback form in front of you and access to a pen. You should all have access to a pen. Um, Please fill that out. Um, If you have any more questions that didn't get answered, um, write them down. And um, if you put your name and your phone number, someone from the Christian Union can contact you. um, And you will be able to chat with them and meet with them, and you'll get your question answered. Um, so yeah, please just fill them in, um, and then there will be someone coming around with a basket. Please put them in there, um, but leave the pens on the table, please. Thank you. <laughs> um, if you want to find out any more about Wonder, we have a Facebook event. Please just go and search that. It's just Wonder 2018. And um, all the information, all the timetable, everything that's going on is on there, available for you to see. Um, and we have a Twitter. Please go and follow that, at Wonder Warwick. Um, and the hashtag is Wonder2018, so anything from this week that you put on social media, please um, hashtag that and we'll be able to see it. Um, and then also a website, so warwickcu.org slash wonder. Um, please go on there and any information that you want to find out about Wonder, you'll be able to find out on there. Um, if you can't stay for the next lunch bar, as you leave, there's a table um, full of flies and timetables, so please take as many as you like. Um, thank you so much for coming. Um, and please do stay, grab another sandwich, and John's going to do another talk in just a few minutes. Thank you very, very much.